I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. I think I think I, I think if you if you didn't do well in, in high school or whatever, you probably do better in, in, in later life, to be honest. Yeah, because, well, first off, I 100% agree. I wish... I hadn't gone to high school or college. I think the only reason, the only, I mean, I had the option to graduate high school early because I was taking a lot of summer classes at places. Like I would go to Duke University in the summers and take college courses. So I had credits. They wanted me to graduate a year early, but you know, I was just stupid. I didn't do it. I, there's so many things I didn't do because I liked a girl who didn't like me. <laughs> so I would stay in high everyone. school just because the girl I liked was a year younger. I, like I was in 11th grade, she was in 10th grade. And so I would just stay, I, instead of graduating in 11th grade, I stayed through to 12th grade, which was a waste of time for me. And then another time I, I got an offer uh, when I, this is many years later, this is 1991. I was, I was in the process of getting thrown out of graduate school and I got an offer to work at IBM to work on the chess computer Deep Blue, which ended up beating Gary Kasparov, who was the first <laughs> yep, computer right. to beat Gary, uh, a world chess champion. So people thought AI was happening and it was a whole big thing. And so I had some ideas for the deep blue guys, like, just like now, just like I do now, I shared my ideas. And one of my ideas was, and this is only interesting if you follow these things, but one of my ideas was typically a chess program looks at your, uh, it analyzes your moves and then the opponent's moves and your responses to those moves. And it builds a big tree. It looks at trillions of positions or billions of positions and then finds the best move. And so I had an idea. What if you skip a move every now and then? If you skip a move and then one side automatically is winning, that means that's a critical line. That's a critical move to look at. And uh, uh, and I won't, you just think about it. I won't explain all things. But the point is that would have been a very exciting job to take. And here I was, right. I was getting thrown out of graduate school anyway. I had nothing to do in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was getting thrown out of graduate school but I remember I liked this girl, Amy Friedman. We were dating <laughs> and it was clear that she wanted to break up with me. And so I felt like if I left for, you know, IBM, which was in, I guess, Armonk, New York, uh, there would be no, I, this relationship would have no chance. And of course I only knew her a few weeks, but I wanted to marry her and have kids and everything. And so, so I stayed, so I turned down the job, stayed with Amy who did break up with me a month later. And then for the next uh, for three years, I stayed in Pittsburgh until finally I, I took a job at HBO. 
But um, all of this is to say, I, I, you know, I, I, what, I, what I was saying to you earlier was in high school, there was 360 people in my class. Nobody from my high school typically went to good colleges. They would go to like local colleges or community colleges or whatever. It wasn't, I wasn't in one of those high schools like, oh, but we're the top, we're in the top five public schools in the country. We weren't even in the top five public schools in our town. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that was, it was just a shitty school. No offense to anybody who's from the school listening to it. I had great friends there, but actually I had no friends there. I take that back, <laughs> but uh, they're my friends now, but they weren't my friends then. Um, but uh so I was dead set in the middle of the rankings because I never even attended class. They Every month they would threaten to expel me because I would just skip school all the time. And I wouldn't even tell my parents. Sometimes my parents were like, why did the school call us today? And I'm like, I don't know. But even if I was number one in my class, I wouldn't have gotten into any good schools because there's there's like, I don't know, there's like thousands of decent public schools in New Jersey, in New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. And the number one, number two, and number three students in each class is applying to all the good schools. Why would they pick any of them, let alone me, who was ranked number 123? And I didn't do a lot of after-school activities. Like there was like some, uh, the charity club, who cares? I didn't do that. <laughs> and uh, Or there was like ma the mathletes. Like I was supposed to be good at math. I went to one mathletes competition and I came in like last in the, in the state. And so, but this is why I always say it's better to be the only than to be better. So even if I was a better student, like, you know, the number two student in this whole school, I wouldn't have gotten in any different, you know, but right. I ended up going to a good college, a very good college in Ivy league school. And I'm not bragging about that because one thing people should know about Ivy league schools <laughs> is that unless it's Harvard, okay, I'm giving Harvard a pass unless it's Harvard, which it wasn't in my case, the students are no better than anywhere else. There are smarter students in the average community college than at Cornell or where I went. And I won't speak for the other schools. I'll just trash Cornell. I have no problem with that. By the way, can I tell you a story? That's a segue. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so one time the Cornell alumni club in New York city asked me to give a talk about education and it was me and it was the head of New York state Department of Education. It was like the Secretary of Education for New York. It was like uh, there were professors from Cornell who were speaking, including the chairman of the computer science department where I had my major. And so I went up there and I said, I learned nothing at Cornell. I learned every. <laughs> In fact, when I took a job after Cornell, I, I was so bad at computer programming where I had spent my whole time at Cornell programming computers and then graduate school programming computers. And, uh, the, I, I was so bad at programming when I had my first real job at HBO, they had, they had to send me to remedial programming classes for, for two months. I had to go to like this AT&T facility and learn how to do basic programming because you don't learn real life skills in college right. and all these things, high school and college, you just, people say, oh, you learn a style of thinking. No, you don't. You just have to memorize. You have to memorize formulas yeah. or you have to memorize. Like I always say, I ask two questions to people be, be, like who Tell me when Charlemagne, the greatest king in Europe, he unified all of Europe, the first king to unify Europe. Tell me when he was born. Almost nobody gets it right within 500 years. I asked this to Alexis Ohanian, who was the, um, he was the founder of Reddit. Now he's married to Serena Williams. I was on his podcast a while ago and he told me, we were just chatting. He told me he majored in European history. And I'm like, okay, tell me when Charlemagne was born. And he said, um, 1200 something. No, it was 754 AD. You majored in European studies. What? And I'm not, I'm not saying he's not smart. I'm saying if you learn through memorization, which is the technique of not only America, but it comes from this learning technique comes from the England for, for a reason, which I can explain, but it doesn't work. Another question that's great to ask is who was the president before Abraham Lincoln? Arguably, one of the most important presidents ever because his actions led directly to the civil war and no one could remember. I think that's unfair though. What if I, what if I didn't grow up in, 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 in the States? I wouldn't okay, know I anyway. Would give, I would give you a pass because I don't know who the president of Malaysia is. Yeah. But like, if you're, here's the thing about Charlemagne and about the, the, the president who started the civil war is right. that, <laughs> is that every schoolboy learns it starting from fourth grade. You learn it every year, by the way, you don't learn it just once fourth grade, right. fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way through 12th grade, 
And then, and then if you major in European history or U S history or government or economics, you're going to certainly learn it in college every single year. And right. no one could ever tell James Buchanan, by the way, also probably the first gay president, uh, was, was the, uh, uh, president right before Abraham Lincoln and famously said, uh, to Abraham Lincoln on inauguration day, if you enjoy coming in here as much as I enjoy leaving here, then you will have a good life. <laughs> so, cause he hated being president and no, for, for good reason, he caused the civil war. So, uh, uh, but my point is using like techniques, like, and I'm, I'm not trying to market my book here, but using techniques and skip the line, these are how you really learn skills like the plus minus equal technique, the micro skills technique, the 10,000 experiment rule. And I've talked about that on other podcasts, but the point is again, how did I get into a good college or a good graduate school, or then get a job at HBO or then raise money for a hedge fund when I had no experience or sell a business when it was barely a business or so many other things in my life. I am really grateful to the thing that made me the only instead of just better. Now I tried many things. So when I was younger, this is going to sound odd to people, but I was a really good, this was the mid eighties. I was a really good break dancer when I was a little kid. <laughs> like I Wait, was obsessed really? with it. Yeah. You didn't know that? I, I was obsessed with break yeah. dancing. I would do it. I would practice for hours a day. I would go to these non-alcoholic clubs where other kids like me, we would battle in break dancing. And I won't even tell you my, you know, everybody has a, a, pseudonym in those oh uh, wait right you have to tell me what is it what is it called is it it's, dr professor or whatever no no it was the vanilla popper because <laughs> everyone else was black and i was white and so and uh, my the guy i would That's kind great. of work with is he was black i was white so and then i would wear like all black he would wear all white and then we would battle these other crews and uh uh but anyway my parents and grandparents were like this is not going to get you help you at all getting into college. Like they thought it was, they were probably racist. I don't know. And they, they thought it would not help me into get into college. So one time, um, I, I vaguely knew the rules of chess. I, I was almost 17 years old. I barely knew how to play chess and they needed an, the chess team needed someone to play. And it's, it's weird how you remember things as a kid, but I cannot remember what I had for breakfast this morning. But like, right. I remember, um, I remember they asked me, Hey, we need someone on the fifth board, meaning the bottom board, uh, uh, to play against this, the team from Matawan, this other town in New Jersey. And I remember going there with the team and I didn't know any chess. So they gave me a book to read. It was the Stonewall variation by Fred Reinfeld. I remember the book and I remember the game that I played and I won almost instantly. And, and then I like, oh, and they, and, and they liked me. The other members of the team liked me because of this. And I think we do things because we want to be liked, or maybe I didn't love myself enough. And so I said, oh, this is a way to be loved. And it also felt good to win. So I, I asked my dad to show me, he, he was a good player in the sixties. I asked my dad to show me how to play some more, you know, games. And I bought some more books and I got gradually got obsessed within a year. When I was 18, I won the New Jersey junior championship. I was the best player in New Jersey uh, under 21 and I won the New Jersey high school championship and I was playing in the U S junior championship and the U S uh, national high school championship was, which was the high school champions of each state. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went for my interview at Cornell, you know, they have an alumni interview you. I, I walk into his house and on the board was a chess position. And I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? And he said, Oh, I'm, I'm a, a chess player. I play in tournaments and I am studying this game. And I said, it looks like Timonov Fisher, uh, Mark Timonov versus Bobby Fisher, 1971. And he said, that's right. How do you know? And I told him I was chess master and I helped him analyze the game. He was much lower ranked than me. And right. so I got into college, no problem. Then graduate school, I, uh, I was, I loved computer science. I was obsessed and I was already writing my first published paper when I was still in college. Usually people don't do that till they're working on their PhD. And so I loved it so much, but every graduate school rejected me because my grades were not good. I was never a good student. My, I would show up, I would never, I would never go to class and I would show up for tests a day late. I was just failing all my classes. And, um, but I was obsessed with the research side with actually doing things in computer science, but every graduate school rejected me. 
And then I, and I applied to Carnegie Mellon, which at the time was number one. It was probably better than Stanford and MIT. Now it's probably number three or equal to Stanford and MIT. I applied there. Magically, I got in. I didn't know why I got in. And then I, I, when I went there, my office mate was the guy who made the deep blue computer. At the, at the time, it was called chip test. It was just in the hardware form. And the guy who was the, the student who was working on it, who was a ranked chess master or had already le- gotten his PhD and left for IBM. So they needed another chess player there. So my, my job as a student was just to play deep thought all day long. And then whenever I beat it, they would kind of take it apart and figure out what went wrong. Cause it's got obviously wrong if it lost to a, a loser like me. And you know, and that ended up being the computer that again, beat Kasparov. So again, it was being the only, I was the only chess master at the Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon grad school had a 3% acceptance rate then. And somehow I got in a mediocre student that got rejected everywhere else. I mean, I got rejected at my, the safety schools of my safety schools. And yet the best school accepted me because of chess. Then I go to HBO and I'm applying for a job. Every interview I failed, failed like they would ask me like, okay, do you know how to program a Mac? No. Do you know like how to program um, network communication on Unix computer? No. Do you know how to, um, you know, objects or no, I just didn't know anything. Do you know anything about account? No. Do you know Oracle? No, I didn't know anything. And so I left, I remember there was pay phones back then. I called my girlfriend in Pittsburgh and I said, well, um, looks like I'm not going to get a job here. I failed every interview. And then in Bryant Park, right next to HBO, I saw this guy who I had played chess with years earlier in a tournament and Elon Schwartz, who's, who's actually been on this podcast. He's a, he's a poker champion now. And, um, this was in 1994. So I've known Elon for God, all my adult life. And, um, Elon and I played and I beat him. He was, he's a much stronger player than me. Actually, he's a very strong master, but I, I beat him that game. And I look up and my, the guy who would have been my boss's boss's boss was staring, looking at a table. Turned out he was a very, he was very interested in chess. He was a ranked chess player, but of course, lower rank than me. And he said to me, I never saw anyone beat that guy before. And so we took a walk around Brian Park talking about chess the whole time. And a few weeks later, he called me, not the person who would be my boss or boss's boss, but this guy, Robert called me and offered me the job. And then it turns out when I got there, his group that worked for him, he had about a hundred people that worked for him in the afternoons after work ended, had a big competition with another group. And it was an ego competition. His Robert's group had chess players. The other group had chess players, but I was by far the best. So he wanted to basically just for ego, get me on his uh, hire me so I could crush the other guy's group at, at chess. So that was getting into HBO. And then when I sold my first business, um, one of the acquirers was interested in chess, but not as strong as me. They were very impressed. Several times I've been acquired because they were, um, they, everybody thinks chess equates with intelligence. Sometimes in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. Um, there is a discipline though, to studying chess and there is some things related to intelligence, but a lot of people like Bobby Fischer, perhaps the greatest chess player ever, is kind of a maniac in every other area of life. So, I mean, he's dead now, but he was a maniac. And, and then when I was raising money for a hedge fund, as soon as they heard I was a chess master, people would invest. I wouldn't even say chess was related to money management or intelligence. They would just know this fact about me. They would come up in conversation. They'd give me money. And again, and again, even when I'm introduced for talks, I don't tell people to say this, but they always introduce me by saying I'm a chess master and on and on and on. It's helped me in so many areas of life. And so the purpose of this is not to say how great I am. It's actually to say how mediocre I am. And this artificial thing kind of helped me in terms when people had to make a decision between, it's hard to tell who is smarter than another person. It's hard to say this person, because he has a better SAT score. Let's say someone has a 1400 on the SATs and another person has a 1300, but maybe the other person has good clubs, after school clubs. They were in the, the key club or they play basketball or whatever. I didn't have any sports, by the way, I didn't even play again for my high school chess team because I was so much, this is going to sound egotistical, but I was so much better. It wasn't really fun for me to play in the chess team. So I had no after-school activities other than 
that I was New Jersey's junior chess champion. And there was no reason that would make me a better performer at Cornell. In fact, I almost failed out of Cornell. That's a whole other story. And at HBO, you know, I did good, but I wouldn't say above and beyond. And then my business was good, but not above and beyond, but it was still acquired. And when I, my hedge fund was kind of a mediocre hedge fund, I, I actually stopped doing the hedge fund business because Bernie Madoff wouldn't put, wouldn't invest money with me. And, you know, I figured, well, if he doesn't invest money with me, I'm just never going to raise money. And nobody knew he was a scam at the time, but that that's a whole other story. And then just time after time, it's really helped me in life. And so I'm not saying go play chess. I'm saying focus on being the only rather than the better. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. 
That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So one of my daughters, I'm totally against my daughter's and son, my son's already graduated, but I'm totally against my daughters going to college. And they know that one time when my daughter Josie was 13, I said, look, you're not going to college. And she just turned around and walked away from me. And I'm like, you can't, you can't walk away from me. I'm your father. And she just kept walking. Like she just wouldn't hear that because it was so much against the philosophy that society teaches you. But nevertheless, I want them to not hate me because when they really need me in life, when they're 27, 28, 30, I want to show them that I'm there for them. So if they choose to go to college, I, I'm supportive of it, even though I tell them I'm against it and I tell them all the reasons and I give them my book, The 50 Alternatives to College. And anyway, the point is my daughter, one of my daughters didn't, didn't really get in to a lot of colleges, the colleges she wanted when she applied a year ago. And, and she felt really bad about it. It's really, and again, it's, it's random. Like these colleges now have a 5% acceptance rate, like across the board. It's ridiculous what's going on. There's such a, there's such a demand for a college that's irrational. It's like a bubble. And so she was disappointed. She really should have gotten in everywhere, but just the luck of the dice. She was a great student, like a 4.0 student, which is all A's. She would play for the basketball team. She did charity. She's a great human being, like really, she works hard at jobs. And so I said, why don't you take a gap year? And instead of just making a better essay, let's, let's let you try out being the only at something. And it has to be something you love. So we tried different things that she loved. And what she really loved was oddly race car driving. 
And so she took race car lessons. She participated in races. She got her race car driving license. She can now professionally race if she wants. Boom. She got in everywhere and is going to Duke next year, which is a very good school. I actually spent my summers there after in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade taking college classes. So she became the only, she's the only one applying who is literally a professional race car driver. So I bet if she applied to Harvard, she would have gotten in. It's important to take your interest. And by the way, uh, we did a podcast recently with John Lee Dumas. He has a good exercise for how to find out what your passions are. In my book, Skip the Line, I also describe some techniques that are different from John's. Both both are good. At any point in life, doesn't mean you you don't have to be 18. You could be 70. You could be 60. You could be 27 and trying to figure out what you want to do in life. You know, use one of these techniques, and I describe them in other podcasts. Find your passions, find your interests, find unusual ways to explore those interests. Like if you're in, if you're 40 years old and interested in sports, you're not going to be a professional athlete. But listen to our podcast with Joe Pompliano, the the author of Huddle Up, how he used his interest in sports to change careers completely from a really good job on Wall Street to an even better job doing what he loves. Or Matt Berry, he was in his 30s. He was a successful Hollywood screenwriter, but he loves sports. He's not going to be a professional athlete but he used what I call a spoken wheel technique. I describe his story in my book, Skip the Line. Um, to he, he now has a career in sports and you can listen to that podcast as well with Matt Berry. But there are many ways to be the only and people are fascinated by things. They're fascinated by chess. They're fanas- fascinated by being a sports competitor, like a ranked sports competitor. They're fascinated by stand-up comedy or race car driving. So find out where your interests intersect with what people are fascinated by and, you know, maybe write and self-publish a novel when you're 15 years old or 18 years old. I guarantee you that will help you get into any college you want. Or, I don't know, work at the White House for a year. Now, I don't know how you can do that, but in my book, Skip the Line, I have uh, a chapter, uh, Take Two Steps Backwards to Move Three Steps Forward, which helped a young man named Joey Coleman to work at the White House, the CIA, and the FBI by kind of taking lower, almost menial jobs for himself, but using those to catapult into the next job. And there's many, many things, but always focus on this one philosophy. It's better to be the only than the better. And I've spoken about this before on the podcast, but this is regards specifically careers or being accepted to things like colleges or, uh, I don't know, even with comedy, I was the only one who was older, but I was the only one who had, um, very rich experience in other areas of life because all these comedians started at the age of 20 or even younger. So I started at a later age, which meant I knew a lot about a lot of things and I was had a different style. And plus I had a lot of social media followers as a result. So I had a different style of comedy than the other comedians. And now everyone told me I couldn't skip the line now because I was not only perhaps better or maybe not, but I was the only. And so people would come, would drive across the you know, tons of miles to see me if I was in their country or state or whatever. And, uh, you know, I think that's all I have to say about it, but I'm just amazed all the time how much I can't even remember a single thing I learned in college or high school. Like I've taken five years of French, four years of high school French and one year of college French. And by the way, anyone who studies French is a loser. (laughs) Because what do you use French for? Why didn't I at least study Spanish, which half the world speaks, or well, Chinese, which is the did, biggest country in the world? Didn't French is like the most romantic language out there? Well, Mr. that's Pupu, why. You know, like, you know, like, you know my so, sister so spoke French and I loved her and wanted to speak French. and um, But it was like stupid. Like I was telling this to Robert yesterday and she's like, oh, well, you know, French was like the cool thing to study. And I'm like, trust me, I didn't, I didn't become cool by like going up to all the jocks and saying, hey man, I'm taking French. I'm the cool guy. <laughs> like that did not help me become cool at all. I never was cool. And, and in French fries. Yeah, and look, by the way, after five years of French, I could not, I know the word we, oui, and I know I could say qu'est-ce que c'est, but I don't even know what that means. Does it mean? What does that mean? I don't even know. I don't know. Uh, uh, and that was like a common French phrase. I don't know anything anymore in French. I, I know... I probably know more Spanish than French and I don't know Spanish. I never studied Spanish, but you know, now I'm living in a town where 60% of the people have speak Spanish. They're all from South America and I don't, I don't know Spanish. I I should have studied Spanish, 
But um, I don't know why I brought that up. It's okay, you know. Like every sometimes you have to brag about how much you learn in a language and never know how to use them. Oh yeah, I think that's a common quote unquote <laughs> trope. Trope is, is. The, is the new synergy. Like there's always these words that never existed before that suddenly become popular. Like yeah. in every podcast, I think uh, you might have noticed the word trope is used by someone, usually me. But see, see, like I have recorded, I have recorded, I would say like at least three more than three hundred episodes of your podcast. Like. Every single podcast trope came up, but I have no idea what does that mean. It, it's like just a common theme, like right. oh, a common trope of TV shows is the main character is not pretty, but then she has a makeover, and now everyone thinks she's pretty. Yeah, why did you just say theme? Why do you have to say trope? You know, uh, I don't because theme is not quite accurate. I don't know what a better word is. A common. Structure, S- common formula. Yeah, common formula. That would work. Yeah, common yeah. formula. T- hey. the, the hundred most common TV formulas. I think isn't there a website that someone told us TVTropes.com? I think Chuck t- Wendig, who wrote for TV shows, told us about TVTropes.com. Um, yeah, TVTropes.org. Yeah. So, like for instance, um, <laughs> uh, here I'm at TVTropes.com, and uh, let's see, common tropes. What 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 can I find? Uh, Follow TV trips. Uh, newest trope is living program. In real life, programs are lines of code and data made to execute a function. In fiction, they tend to be something more. The living program itself is completely made of data, but it possesses a physical form which can wander around cyberspace. Oh, so like for instance, oh, oh, oh right. <laughs> like, well, remember that movie? I think it was called Her. Right. With but what, what, did Joaquin she, Phoenix. Did she, did she wander around in cyberspace though? But yeah, like, remember at the end. She was only just in cyberspace, oh, like talking to her all the other right, 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 living right. things, and you know, so yeah. so that was a common trope. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, like uh, I don't know if you watch Justice League. Justice League cyborgs just walk around in cyberspace, and um, then uh, uh, oh yeah, no, Tron, I don't know. And Tron okay. uh, is it Tron? Tron? Is it uh, Tron? Oh, Tron! I never saw that. Yeah, right. Tron is, is in living in cyberspace too. So. So let me let me let me. I'm looking at now the the main tropes. So uh, here's uh, let's look at a trope for uh, action. Um, uh, uh, so so the action genre is is a kind of trope. So right. the typical scenario of the pro, of the protagonist is an action in an action is a plot specific. A uh, series of mini stories in the forms of fights or challenges, usually featuring extended violence with the prevalence of firearms, because the protagonists are in direct physical danger. Um, the story in an action typically shades in comparison to the visuals. Uh, oh, so let me let me find a different. Um, oh, right, you know oh, this this would be a great thirty days book challenge for anyone out there. You know, like just go to tvtropes.org and find the tropes and just write a novel of, on it about yeah. it. You know? Yeah, so so here's a trope. I have no idea what this is. Uh, it's the rule of cool. So, uh, uh, so sometimes, you know, like let's say people teleport. That can't happen in real life, but right. somehow, you know, scientific laws are circumvented by this trope. And I don't know what this trope is. Let me see. Uh, viewers will forgive liberties with reality as long as the result is wicked awesome. <laughs> so, for instance, remember the movie uh, Jumper, where yep. Hayden yep. Christensen can teleport. Like, yep. clearly, they never explain how that can nope. happen, or, nope. or you know, what the science is. We have to nope. completely be willing. The viewer can't just say, "Well, this is stupid," nope. and they shut off after five minutes. Well, they they have to like buy into it. The reason they buy into it is because, man, wouldn't it be cool to do it? Yeah. So the rule of cool is a trope which allows you to circumvent the. I th- I think I think that's why they establish like the first few scenes, like him jumping around, stealing monies, and enjoying life. Like, like yeah, it's like it's like your yeah. it's like imaginary. Yeah. Like, um, okay, so let me see. Um, uh, All right, one more trope, uh, and we have to go because you have a meeting next. Yeah, narrative tropes. Uh, okay, here's one. Um, okay, a very big trope is abusive parents. Parents are supposed to be protectors of children. But these parents were either so damaged themselves they can't do the job, or they're greedy or villainous, blah blah blah. And abusive parents are commonplace in fairy tales and classical mythology, which makes this trope older than feudalism, which is another trope. 
then sometimes a parent will go as far as to kill the child in question. And this trope is a subtrope called offing the offspring. And in other cases, the parent's abuse occasionally drives the offspring to snap and become a self-made orphan. They kill their parents and become self-made. So a self-made orphan could also be like Oliver Twist, which was a Charles Dickens, oh. uh, you know, or even the, the abusive parents trope is Harry Potter is a right. classic yeah. example. Uh, so, so a lot of b stories are combinations of these tropes and these tropes are very old. So we relate to them because we've seen these in nonstop movies. Like here's another one, the jerk index. And, uh, you can you can think of all the movies you've seen where the main character has to deal with a jerk. Like what was that movie with um, Ben Stiller and Cameron Diaz uh, that was very funny and the jerk had was always was secretly in love with Cameron Diaz. What, ben Stiller called? was there's dating some, her. And there's he something would always, about Mary. Oh, there's something about Mary. Yeah, and the the jerk would always give Ben Stiller really bad advice to ruin his dates because he liked Cameron Diaz. Right. And so that's an example of the jerk trope. And so if you figure out like, you know, which three or four tropes to use, you can get yourself a plot. Like imagine the rule of cool with abusive parents with the jerk trope. And actually, guess what? That's Jumper. He had abusive parents. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. His, his mom abandoned him and his dad always yelled at him. And so finally he jumped away. That's how he learned how he's had his power. There was the jerk who would always show up and say, get away. And and there was, um, uh, uh, what was the other trope I said? Uh, uh, the jerk trope, uh, abusive trope, and the awesome trope. The, the, oh, yeah, the, the rule awesome. of cool. Because it, it's cool, like, yeah. yeah. So now suddenly, that literally knowing those three tropes, you could write that, that story, which was right. horribly acted, by the way. Because Hayden Christensen quite possibly is the worst famous actor on the planet. Well, he's going he's gonna to be back for Duff Raider. Oh my God. He's going to so be back for a Duff Raider. <laughs> for, I mean, uh, you should almost post. I wish we could post, if we, you're allowed to do this, I wish we could post a video clip of him explaining to Padme what's going the on. Sand. That the was sand. the. I was like cringing throughout the entire scene, even when the first time I saw it. And now it's even worse. Like, I, I literally, I, I, I kind of vomit in my mouth a little bit, like when that scene happens. It's it's so isn't that like life is like a sand or whatever? Was, yeah, I, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I think. By the, the way, by the way, why does Padme's apartment, which is like a penthouse looking over the city of the capital of Alderaan, uh, why does it have no furniture? Like, well, um, like if you think about it, like there's no kitchen. The, none of the Star Wars high end luxury apartment has no kitchen. Yeah, no if kitchen. You think about it, no, no bathrooms. No, no. Where did the Millennium Falcon have a bathroom? There was no uh, nobody ever said I got to stop playing this three dimensional chess with Wookie with, with the with, with Chewbacca and go to the bathroom. No one ever no, says no. that. Yeah, the only thing we know that there's in Millennium Falcon is they have a there's a compressor that they need to fix all the time. Every time something breaks down, it's always the compressor. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, the compressor or the the what's that thing Luke yells when the Millennium Falcon is breaking down? It's the it's the bump of the, the modulator. Uh, like there's some technical thing he's yelling and it's like, what? Okay. They know science. <laughs> By the way, I don't think Star Wars is a science fiction movie. No. It uses the, it's, it's a hundred percent the Western trope with that happens to be in space. It's a Western that takes place in space, which right. by the way, is like the Mandalorian. Mandalorian is the main essence that what Josh Lucas wanted the Star Wars to be. Yeah. Mandalorian is totally a Western in space with the force. Yep. So it's wizard. like if John Wayne was on another planet and could also move objects with his mind, uh, or at least someone in this show could move objects with their mind, then that right. would be uh, uh, Star Wars. Right. So anyway, um, this is a, an advanced version of any discussion I've had about better to be only than the, than the best. And this comes through in a lot of our podcasts, but I would encourage people to listen to my podcast with Brian Keating because you can't just be the best physicist to win the Nobel Prize. There's other aspects. There's there's like, you know, Einstein had his special look. There were other people doing just as interesting science, but he had the look of a genius scientist. And, you know, he had this great way of taking the, his, his, his thought experiments and translating them to complicated math so the everyday person could understand and 
the scientists could understand. And he, he was the only one able to, to do that. So he stood out. And so, um, but anyway, that's for another, another <laughs> podcast, but thank you very much, Jay, for playing along and doing a little podcast with me yeah. and, yeah, and for welcome. everyone out there, this is the way you get into anything you want. Yep. That's it. Be the only one. Yeah. Right? Be the only, maybe we should call this one, you know, how to get everything you want. <laughs> that's for sure. That's it. <laughs> yep. Thank you. The McNugget Buddies are back. But this time, they got a fresh look as part of the new Kerwin Frost Box at McDonald's. We're talking all new buddies, dressed head to toe in the freshest fits. All designed by the artist Kerwin Frost. So when you order the Kerwin Frost box with your choice of 10-piece McNuggets or a Big Mac, you'll get one of the flyest McNugget buddies to go with it. Think you can collect them all? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. At participating McDonald's for a limited time, while supplies last.